physical activity uh, is, is important. We all know that. Um, but what's really interesting is it um, protects us from aging. And we really haven't evolved our way into a situation where we can do it, uh, protect ourselves in, in, in an alternative manner. In other words, we can't lie on the couch and hope this will happen. So uh, an evolutionary perspective explains why inadequate amounts of exercise accelerate aging and contribute to a lot of diseases. So um, it's good to do what the First Lady says, get off the couch. Our next speaker uh, is a professor and chair of the Department of Human Evolutionary Biology and the Edwin M. Lerner Professor of Biological Sciences at Harvard, and he is a member of the Leakey Foundation Scientific Executive Committee. Please welcome Daniel Lieberman. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks very much. So I'm here to talk about uh, uh, another major problem that confronts the human species. Uh, let's see if I can get this to work, which is that um, most of us uh, know that exercise is good for us, but none of us, uh, not many of us get enough exercise. Now, before I go any further, I, I realize that the topic of, of exercise can be a pretty annoying uh, topic. Most people uh, I know want to exercise more, and the last thing they want to do is be badgered or shamed for not exercising enough. And I want to emphasize that uh, the evolutionary perspective I'm going to take, I hope will explain to you that, A, that's not my opinion, <clears throat> and B, actually, I think it explains why it's, uh, it's wrong to actually shame or blame people for not exercising enough. Uh, and in fact, that's the heart of what we call, I call the exercise dilemma, which is that, uh, is that although exercise is really good for us, not enough of us really get enough. And I think a, the lens of evolution helps explain uh, why this is the case, but also what we can do about it. But before we get to the evolution part, let's first talk about the exercise dilemma. The, the two key issues are uh, that exercise is good for us and that not enough of us uh, get enough. So let's talk about the good news. So the good news is that exercise really is, is healthy. And there's, this is not, of course, an insight. People have known this for thousands of years. Uh, you know, Hippocrates wrote that, um, um, that, you know, that uh, Eating alone will not make a man well. He must also take exercise. This is, this is, this is old news. However, now with the tools of, of modern science, we can actually uh, quantify just how good exercise is for us, holding constant other effects like diet and sanitation. And there are many studies, but one study that was done here in, at, at Harvard Medical School is the, the famous Harvard Nurses Study, which has followed more than 100,000 nurses since the 1970s, and they've measured uh, their health and their, how they die and, and what they eat and how much exercise, et cetera. And these studies have shown that the women who, uh, in the study who were sedentary versus those who were active, uh, if you control for the effects of weight, died about 53% a faster rate. Whereas those who are overweight versus those who are lean, if you control for exercise, died about a 90% faster rate. So that what this says is that, uh, that obesity is a more serious uh, cause of, of mortality than exercise, but exercise is pretty darn important. And it's not just uh, mortality, it's also morbidity, right? The illness that you get. It's very hard to measure those values precisely because everybody is different, the doses are very complicated, but these are consensus estimates based on how much less you're likely to get various chronic diseases based on exercising just 150 minutes a week. So that's five times a week for 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise. And as you can see, coronary heart disease levels are lowered by at least 40%, high blood pressure by 50%, strokes by 27%, diabetes by 50%, so, and so on and so on. Even Alzheimer's and dementia are lowered by at least 33%. It's actually the biggest factor that lowers the risk for Alzheimer's. And all told, this is a very expensive. In fact, a, a recent study in The Lancet estimated that the direct costs of this in the United States alone are approximately $28 billion a year. And it's not just mortality and morbidity. There's other good things about exercise. Exercise upregulates uh, growth factors in the brain, like brain-derived neurotropic growth factors, which stimulates the growth of neurons and also repairs them. It upregulates uh, various neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine. And so there's abundant evidence that people who exercise more, and if you control for socioeconomic status and various other factors, are, for example, they're smarter, they're, they're happier, they're less anxious, they're less depressed, they're wealthier, um, they have better sex, they sleep better. Um, uh, you know, so that lends the question, who are these people who aren't getting enough exercise, right? <laughs> and the answer, sadly, is most of us. Again, 
if you, just, if you define uh, physical inactivity as not getting uh, 150 minutes a week, that's the US Surgeon General's minimum requirements, uh, recommended requirements, then about 50 to th percent to, to three quarters of adult Americans are actually, by that definition, sedentary. And children are recommended to get an hour a day, and about two thirds of children in the United States are, are inactive. So it's a, it's a big problem in the United States. And if you think we're the worst part of the world, well, you can think again. This is a graph from the World Health Organization showing uh, physical inactivity among adolescent children around the world. And as you can see, uh, it's a very serious epidemic problem all around the world. And it's clearly something we need to do uh, something about. So the question is, how do we address it? Well, the way in which most people address most problems is looking for the proximate explanations. These are the immediate sort of how questions. And it's not very hard to figure out why most people are physically inactive, because they're doing well what most of the people in this room are doing. They're sitting most of the time. Right? We have jobs that require us to sit most of the day. When we get to work, we sit in order to get there. We, we sit when we watch TV and the internet. Um, we have all kinds of labor-saving devices, like elevators and escalators that prevent us from having to, to break a sweat and raise our heartbeat. We even have constructed our environment so that it's actually difficult sometimes to exercise. Uh, sidewalks are missing from a lot of American uh, suburbs. But those are just proximate explanations. As Theodosius Dobzhensky famously wrote, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And evolution explains why things are the way we are. And, I, and to understand why we have this problem, we also need to take an evolutionary perspective. And I would argue that for most of human evolution, it's pretty obvious that exercise was necessary particularly endurance exercise, but it was also adaptive to spend as little time exercising as possible. So let me explain uh, what that's about. And we'll first talk about endurance exercise. So until about 10,000 years ago, everybody on the planet was a hunter-gatherer and, um, and had to basically you know, hunt and gather all the food that they ate every day. And we know from plentiful studies of hunter-gatherers that they have to work moderately hard. Average hunter-gatherers in Afri for Africa, for example, have to walk between 9 and 15 kilometers a day. To put that into perspective, that's like walking from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. every year uh, uh, in terms of th th those amount of uh, kilometers per day. And when they're walking, they're not just you know, walking down the street. They're carrying babies. They're carrying food. And when they're also spending a lot of time digging, uh, maybe two to three hours a day of digging. Uh, they're also climbing trees. They're throwing. They're doing all kinds of stuff. The men are also pretty active, too, doing all those sorts of things. And another, another activity which I think was very important in evolutionary history was running. Um, before the invention of the bow and arrow, which was only about 100,000 years ago, this is how you got dinner. You actually ran it down. Uh, we call this persistence hunting. But during this method of hunting, hunters will pick an animal. The bigger the animal, at, at the better. And during the peak heat of the day, they'll run it and try to make the animal have to go at a galloping gait. Because when mammals gallop, they can't cool down, but humans can cool down by sweating. And so if you chase an animal for about 15 to 30 kilometers, and that's what uh, this guy is doing for this uh, poor kudu, and you're not actually running the whole time. You're actually running about half the time. So it's about a 15 kilometer run. That's less than a half marathon and about a 15 kilometer walk. And when they're running, they're doing it at a pretty slow speed, about a, a 10 minute mile. So it's like a, like a four hour marathon. Uh, you, it's actually about 40%, about, uh, uh, about 75% uh, successful. So it was a very effective way of getting dinner, and it, was, and it left all kinds of traces in our body, which make us the great runners that we are today. But all that kind of stuff is expensive, right? And it uses energy. And if you think about it, life is about taking energy and using it to make more life. That's basically what we do, right? And, and, and there's only four things you can do with the energy in your body, right? You can spend it growing, right? Once you finish growing, you shouldn't be doing any more, right? You can spend it maintaining your body. That's your basal metabolic rate. You can spend it being active, like hunting and gathering. And you can spend it on reproducing, right? And of course, what does natural selection care about? It cares about reproduction. In the cold calculus of natural selection, all that matters is how many offspring you have who survive and reproduce. And so when energy is limited, if you can figure out a way to spend less energy on those other things and spend more of it on reproduction, you're going to win. And of course, the category in which you want to take the energy from the most is activity. So let's, to put that into perspective, let's compare two mothers from different parts of the world. I'm going to pick the Duchess of Cambridge, because I think she's fair game. And I'm going to compare to a mother from the Hadza tribe in, in Tanzania, because we have very good data from Herman Ponzer 
and colleagues on their energetics. So let's first start with the Duchess of Cambridge. So we know that she's, if she's a typical English woman of her size, that she would require about 2,350 calories a day to maintain her body. That's what she's taking in and spending. About 1,400 of those calories are, are paying for her basal metabolic rate, just paying for her basic body functions. If she's nursing, which I'm hoping she does, because uh, she's got a new one, right? Um, uh, she's probably spending about 600 calories. And as she walks around her palace or opening various you know, supermarkets or whatever the Duchess of Cambridge does, she's probably spending about 150 calories a day doing those sorts of things. So that leaves her a surplus of 200 calories to do anything else that she wants. And if she runs into a deficit, no problem. She can go get a crumpet or a Mars bar or whatever <laughs> and satisfy her energy uh, uh, balance. Not so for the Hadza mother. Hadza women struggle to get enough food. So Ponzer and colleagues have shown that the average uh, energy budget for Hadza mothers are about 1,900 calories a day. They're a bit smaller than the Duchess of Cambridge. So they, their basal metabolic rate is a little over 1,000. They spend about the same amount of energy we think nursing. Um, and they have to do more walking. And so I'm conservatively es estimating that she's spending about 200 calories a day just doing stuff, walking around, getting tubers. That leaves her only 50 calories to do everything else. And that's probably, uh, that's probably an exaggeration. So she's struggling to get enough energy. And she would like to spend as much of that energy as possible on reproduction. And so what does that mean? Is that it means that if, if you're a Hadza mother and you're not out getting energy for your offspring and yourself, the best thing you can do is what people are doing here in this image, which is don't do anything. Right? If you ever walk into a hunter-gatherer camp or a, a village of subsistence farmers, when people aren't actively uh, engaged in food production, they're sitting on the ground, resting and relaxing and gossiping and, and basically taking it easy. And that makes sense when you're in the margins of energy balance and you're trying to maximize your reproductive success. Now, we don't live in those kinds of environments. <laughs> But if any of you ever go to a mall, and you go, you know, in malls, there's always an escalator, a big, huge escalator, and next to it is a stairway. Stand at the bottom of the, of the escalator and the, and, the, and the stairway and count how many people take the stairs versus how many people take the escalator. Well, there are people who actually do this for a living, and they've found that the worldwide average is that 95% of people take the escalator rather than the stairs when they can. If you put a little sign at the bottom of the stairs begging people to take the stairs and telling, reminding them that it's good for them, et cetera, that number shrinks from 95% to about 90%. So you get about 10% people taking the stairs. It's an instinct to, to, to save energy whenever possible. And I'll make a bet. If we could do, do experiment, if I get the NSF, to, or maybe the Leakey Foundation to give me money and put an escalator in the Kalahari Desert, I'll make a bet that the Hadza or the Bushmen there would be using the escalator rather than, rather than um, climbing up the sand dunes. So why then didn't natural selection adapt us to cope with, the, with the, the need not to exercise? And there are three basic reasons. The first is that a lot of the physiological systems we use to exercise are really costly. Like just the muscles that you have in your body, even though you're just sitting and not using them right now, they're costing you about 20% of your metabolic rate. They're expensive, which is why we evolved to lose them when we don't use them. And it's why we also need, we need to, to use them in order to, to develop more muscles. And that's true of many of the physiological systems of our body. In order to, to develop capacity, you have to stress the body to develop those capacities. The second problem, of course, is that until recently, nobody was ever able to live a life of sedentism. It wasn't possible. So people had to be very physically active their whole lives. So there never was any selection for people to cope with the effects of physical inactivity. It's just like the same reason there never was selection for people to lose weight by dieting. That was never an adaptation. And then finally, a lot of the diseases that are caused by physical inactivity don't occur until people are grandparents. So it's after uh, selection uh, becomes less strong. And so uh, the, the effects of, of those diseases are, are under less intense selection. So what do we do? Well, again, the way in which most people tackle this problem is not very evolutionary. Again, they're thinking about expedient sort of proximate solutions. And the three major ways in which we tackle this are to educate people, like how I'm doing right now, having wellness classes and things like that, or, or writing books or whatever. Um, we, of course, apply incentives. So we give people, for example, free gym memberships and things like that. And then people have even tried rebranding exercise and trying to convince people that exercise is fun. As you can see, I don't think that's a very effective strategy. In fact, the evidence is that none of these, these strategies has turned out to be all that effective. Again, I think that we can turn to evolution. Remember, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And we evolved to exercise to be physically active for two reasons. The first was out of necessity. 
we had to be fit, we had to be athletes for most of our evolutionary history in order to survive, in order to get the food that we needed uh, to, to 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 feed our bodies and those of our offspring. And the second reason we evolved to be physically active was play. Play is an adaptation among, that's mostly practiced by children that helps them learn skills and develop the capacities that they'll use later on in life. And so if we're going to get more people to exercise, I think what evolution suggests is that we have to make it both necessary and fun. And where do we do that, supposedly? Well, we do that in school, right? We have physical education. And every school system in the country, and most school systems around the world, recognize this. So, for example, Massachusetts mandates that physical education is required for every student in every age, right? Except the problem was that in 1996, the Board of Education removed any minimum requirements for how much physical activity we have in the state. And this is typical of a lot of places around the world. Uh, and that's, of course, to make more time for, people to, for the kids to study for standardized tests. And the results were immediate and dramatic. And a study in 2011 showed that in Massachusetts, the average middle schooler gets less than an hour and a half of exercise a day. And high school students get less than two hours a day. So that's less than 40% of the recommended minimum of the US Surgeon General, which many people consider to be a bare minimum. The same is true also at the college level. It used to be that all universities in the United States required physical education. It was 100%. And that started changing in the 1960s. Harvard was no exception. So in 1970, Harvard voted out any physical education requirement. And the result is that now, data from the University Health Service indicates that only 25% of Harvard undergraduates get the minimum amount of physical uh, activity suggested, again, uh, by the US Surgeon General. And since 20% of Harvard students are on athletes on teams, that means only 5% of the non-athlete population is getting enough exercise. And, and, and we all know why, right? They've got other things to do. And it's an in instinct not to exercise unless you don't have to. But it turns out also that studies show that the kinds of activity that people do in college have strong effects on lifelong behavior. So it turns out that kids who don't exercise that much in college are much more likely not to exercise later on. And those who do exercise are much more, more likely to exercise uh, later on as well. And we know, as I've shown you before, that the ones who do exercise are healthier, they're happier. They're also wealthier, so they'll give more money as alumni, uh, and they'll spend less <laughs> of our taxpayer dollars. So in short, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And I would argue that this also applies to the epidemic of physical activity. We evolved to be athletes. If you have a body, you're an athlete. But we also evolved to avoid unnecessary ac exercise. And if we want to solve this problem and improve human health in a really simple, expedient, easy, um, not very costly way that also makes evolutionary sense, it is that we should work to make exercise both necessary and fun. That's the real solution. And if there's any one place that we should be doing it and focusing our efforts, of course, it's on our schools. It's a, it's a real, um, it's, a, it's a shame. It's a, actually a, 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 it's a communal shame that students in the United States are not getting enough physical activity. Thank you very much. And schools at all levels have reduce their commitment to physical education because of cost, is that it? Or because of teaching to tests, or just laziness? Well, it's, it's, it saves money. But most importantly, uh, the argument is that they're trying to spend those, that time uh, to spend it more on, on, on teaching to tests and, and standardized tests and you know, uh, various shifts in, in the way in which schools are evaluated and how they get funded is based on how well the students do at tests. And so that there's a false trade-off. So what the schools are thinking is that if they get the students to spend more time in school, they'll do better on the tests. But actually, the evidence is that when students exercise more, their, their, their memory improves, their mood improves, they learn better in school. It's a completely false trade-off. So sound mind, sound body, all that's kind of been forgotten, I guess. So. It's so, but it has a strong ba biological basis. Huh. It, do you get the sense that this is changing? Is the educational system getting no. it? No. 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 Oh. But, but we're, we're trying. Right. And we're actually, for example, I have proposed that we reinstitute a physical education uh, or physical activity requirement at Harvard. Let's see how we do. All right. Good, good luck. Good luck. All right.